today I'm talking to Roger Ritzhill Smith, who works for Fosters and Partners, which I think, as most people know, is a world, world leading architectural company. So, Roger, maybe you could just tell me a little bit what your role is in the company. I'm a structural engineer and one of the senior partners at Foster and Partners where I lead the structural engineering team. So you're really involved in the building process of taking these nice architectural designs through to reality. In that context, how do you see the obstacles to achieving uh, lower embodied CO2 in construction? As a designer, I see three priorities. The first is that we need to start systematically measuring and benchmarking the embodied carbon of our buildings and to do so using an agreed, consistent approach. This process is still in its infancy. Measurement systems differ. We're not necessarily comparing like with like and environment, environmental product declarations vary widely in their degree and approach, degree of precision. As designers, we have a pretty good idea of the relative cost of different options. I think we need to acquire the same level of understanding of the relative embodied carbon for those options. The second priority for me is design itself. Decisions taken early on by the client and the designers can have a huge effect on the final embodied energy of a building. And since the cost of bulk materials is correlated with their energy, the energy used in their production, a reasonable way to approach minimizing carbon is to aim to uh, minimize the cost of buildings in a building, materials in a building. A cheaper solution should generally be lower embodied carbon. And my third priority after measurement and design is to improve the specification of the materials that we use. There are large variations in the embodied carbon of exactly the same material, steel, concrete or timber, depending on its source and its method of production. And in addition, we can often use a lower embodied carbon version of the same material, cement's a good example, through more detailed consideration of the requirements for that particular material, rather than specifying a single mix design through a whole project. Any other critical points you'd like to mention? Given the importance of this issue, when you look across the industry, the amount of funding and the number and strength of disruptive startups in construction is surprisingly small. And the reason, in my view, is that the cost benefits in a low carbon approach do not reflect the huge value to society that such an approach brings. Carbon intensive energy is still cheap. So raw materials can be produced in a carbon intensive way without being penalized significantly compared to low carbon materials. So I know that the carbon credit market is evolving and that's encouraging, but I think that we'll know when we're pricing carbon appropriately, if we see a significant change in the investment in low, low carbon technology across the construction industry and across material science. So I'd end by saying that this is an opportunity to radically evolve the way we design, specify and build, and that constructing lower embodied carbon buildings is consistent with making more efficient and more cost-effective buildings. Those aims are completely in harmony.